It's certainly a gigantic honor. It represents recognition by my professional peers, which uh, is certainly uh, uh, makes me feel wonderful. It's also recognition of the discovery uh, that I made. Uh, sometimes uh, you discover something and uh, nobody else thinks it's great, or they don't. What, what have you discovered? Uh, that doesn't seem like anything. Um, and it has. It, it did indeed take a while uh, for. Uh, uh, for it to be uh, recognized as being uh, somewhat distinctive. And uh, that's, the, that's a bit of the frustrating part. Why can't they see what I see? I seem to stumble across things that uh, are really rather obvious in hindsight. And my colleagues are sometimes uh, unwilling uh, to accept them, or it's too simple, uh, or uh, if, if it, it, it would have been discovered before if it was important, it can't possibly be important. <laughs> And uh, that has happened to me over and over again. And the more significant the discovery, it seems, the greater the resistance uh, to, to have it accepted. So in a way, the rewards are finally a vindication. Because they say, OK, now it's accepted. Now people accept that this is, a, uh, uh, this is an important idea. I sat down and interviewed my mother. She told me all sorts of things, including how they got out of Russia, which wasn't easy. And I can now begin to understand my childhood, which was uh, my parents had all their friends, and they had, uh, it was basically a bunch of Russian ladies who had married Polish men. And uh, the reason they ended up in Canada is that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Polish citizens could go back to Poland, and there was a, a brief interval in Poland in mid-1946 where the government w was not, it was not a communist government yet, and they were letting anyone leave who wanted to leave. My parents ended up in a uh, refugee camp, which was a former uh, German army barracks uh, near Salzburg, and uh, that's where I was born. Uh, when uh, my parents, uh, uh, had the opportunity uh, finally to emigrate from Europe. They went to Canada and we ended up on a ship called the Royal Stewart. I was uh, about one and a half years old crawling around on the ship and my mother tells me that I would test every bolt on the ship to see if I could undo it. And, uh, and that, that's what I did. There was no bolt on the ship that was safe for me. And uh, so already you could tell that I was going to be an experimentalist and uh, maybe an engineer. My mother was qu quite well educated for her time. She was a college graduate and uh, was a school teacher. On the other hand, my father uh, came from a very poor family with very limited opportunities for education. He learned to be a tailor. Uh, he was uh, very good with his hands, so I, undoubtedly I must have inherited that from him as I became an experimentalist. Well, I wasn't quite 11, and uh, Sputnik happened. And that had a very big impact in the United States, in Canada, everywhere. Uh, people were, were both impressed and uh, very, very worried. What, what does this mean? I was a mere child, and uh, it was clear that my parents and their friends and their friends regarded this as a very, very important event, and also uh, a very important scientific threshold. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, my parents are really impressed with this. Maybe there's something to this science stuff. Maybe I should go into this science stuff. They seem to respect it very highly. Well, I was a, a wild and crazy a hobbyist experimenter. I experimented with rockets. So it was quite a variety of different hobbies, experiments, different kinds of, just science, just left and right. I entered college. I was at McGill University with every intention of uh, honoring in chemistry. And the chemistry professor said, we're going to do the basics of chemistry and we're going to start with Schrodinger's equation. Well, my mind was not prepared as a freshman for Schrodinger's equation and my mind rebelled. Nothing made any sense. And as a result, I barely, I, I just, barely passed the course. I had almost a failing grade in the course because my mind could not assimilate all these concepts. And I was despondent because my dreams of becoming a scientist 
uh, were dead. Well, they would not accept me into chemistry. They wouldn't let me honor in chemistry. And uh, so what choice did I have? I went over to the physics department. And they were much more liberal. And they said, well, we don't care about this chemistry period. Uh, you know, we'll see how you do. And of course, they, not everybody went all the way through was able to honor in physics. But uh, I found physics very, very easy because it was logical. Unlike the chemistry, which was illogical, you cannot start with Schrodinger's equation. Doesn't, then the subject doesn't make any sense. Uh, with physics, I, I didn't have to study because everything made common sense and, and you could just build it up yourself. And uh, then I went on and I had, I had a very good education. The, the uh, science education, the physics education in Canada is, was and is superb. And uh, it, uh, it gave me uh, some uh, great opportunities uh, to uh, develop myself, including the summer job where you're surrounded by uh, scientists. I mean, this is, this is a fantastic experience. Of course, that, that was the formative experience. But I look back to my uh, assignment then. Uh, the uh, MOSFET transistor had just been uh, uh, perfected to the point where it was commercial. And I was in a nuclear physics lab and told to make some uh, circuits. And uh, they said, here, try these new transistors, but be very careful, they're sensitive to static electricity. In those days, one transistor cost $50, which was a huge amount of money back then. And uh, of course, I paid no mind to the static electricity. I immediately ruined one. And uh, they, it, it was okay. It was okay. And now I tell my students, if you don't break anything, you haven't done it right. Uh, it means you haven't taken sufficient risks. And uh, so it's, it's part of the physics education. And what society invested in me, so I went and looked back after my PhD, and all the equipment I had bought and uh, the facilities and so forth, uh, just to bring me to the point of having a PhD, uh, society had already spent about one million dollars on me. Uh, and uh, that represents somewhat rather forward thing. That's as a very advanced society to realize that this was an important thing to do. The big industrial labs were sending recruiters to uh, the universities and they said, any bright young people around? And they said, oh, well, here's someone. Uh, please come for an interview at Bell Labs. So I interviewed at various places, and it, it was a real cross-examination, the interview. Uh, there, there was a, a scientist there who was very famous. He always found fault with every speaker. And uh, 10 minutes into my interview presentation, he said, well, this is wrong, and, and uh, I answered very courteously, well, it, it looks wrong, but it's actually right. And, so, and, and, and then he bothered me again, and I answered very courteously. And then around the midpoint of my interview, uh, he came up with another objection. And I answered, as anyone who's ever read the famous paper by Keldish would know. <laughs> and that put him in his, in his place. And apparently that won it for me. <laughs> that, was, that was the, uh, everyone, okay, he, uh, uh, he held his own against, uh, 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 against uh, tough criticism. The, uh, the beauty of that period of time, which we cannot reproduce today, which is not available to the young people today, is that uh, the great industrial research labs gave uh, more freedom than you'd have academic freedom. Okay, just to give an example, uh, when I uh, joined the labs, it was, okay, uh, instead of them telling me what to do, it was, what would you like to do and how can we help you? And uh, that's a little bit hard to find. And, but it was a great opportunity to grow. Uh, the, uh, the only drawback is it was uh, rather inward looking uh, when I uh, joined them. It was called The Labs. They, it, well, they thought they were the only ones. And uh, that was uh, rather ingrown. So that, that was a great experience to go elsewhere. I'd say, no, there are, there's great stuff being done other places too. And there's new people to learn from and a whole new uh, areas of science to explore. And uh, uh, I've had a diversity of experiences. I've worked at three universities and three industrial research labs. I have always tried to cover all of science uh, between the following limits. I would not go into uh, high energy physics. 
and I would not go into biology, but everything in between, all the chemistry, the low energy physics, all of uh, those things, I felt I was, uh, uh, I was duty bound to uh, try to uh, learn about. So I've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work in different areas, but uh, always uh, doing things that I was interested in. And I'm usually interested in the simplest things that surround us. Uh, when it came, uh, for example, to working on solar cells, we were always trying to improve the solar cells. Uh, but uh, there was uh, a thought that they could be improved by trapping the light internally. And I found that you could improve the light absorption by approximately 50 times. Five, zero, 50 times, that, that's a huge effect. And uh, I, I, it, it was kind of irresistible. And uh, it, uh, it was, I regard, a big discovery, but it took many years for it to be accepted uh, as, as valid. Uh, but uh, it's today, it's in every uh, solar panel. That's uh, uh, one opportunity I had. I think uh, the next great opportunity I had was to uh, look with fresh eyes on the problem of making a laser and uh, how, uh, how that could be uh, changed. And people had just started thinking about manipulating the band structure of uh, the, um, uh, the electron bands in a semiconductor and uh, what would strain do. And I heard about this. I said, wait a minute, strain. I can use that to make lasers better. There's a problem in lasers that needs to be solved. It can be solved with strain. And that sort of fell into my lap. But I, when I went to the people who made lasers, I said, oh, strain, are you crazy? That'll ruin our lasers. We don't, we don't want that. So that, that also took a little while to be accepted. Uh, it was a very creative period for me because it was only a year later that I was thinking about uh, inhibited spontaneous emission and how uh, we could uh, uh, make uh, periodic dielectric structures and what we call today photonic crystals, how we could uh, use them to uh, control spontaneous emission. And uh, that turned out to be a very fruitful uh, scientific area. And uh, with applications, but also an idea that had been overlooked for about 100 years, which t t I don't understand why it had been overlooked. That should have been the, uh, identified uh, perhaps at least 50, maybe 80 years earlier, and had sort of slipped through the cracks. So I'm rather proud of that. Uh, I've uh, started uh, four companies, and each of them introducing a new scientific concept. Uh, sometimes uh, at the commercial level, uh, these things are a little bit harder to explain. But uh, more recently, I've put forward an idea. This is an idea I've believed in for a long time, uh, but it's not, it goes back to uh, photovoltaic skin and solar cells, that a, a great solar cell should also be a great LED, and that solar cells, when they're working properly, emit light. And uh, this enabled uh, uh, my company uh, to, uh, my, my solar company, to break the world record in solar cell efficiency, which it still holds, 28.8% in the single junction solar cell. And it was trying to follow this principle. A great solar cell should be a great, a great LED. I experienced to this day a huge resistance on this. And part of the reason is, it's a solar cell, it's supposed to take in light. Why should it give any light back? It boggles the imagination. Which of your many achievements are you most proud of? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm rather proud of all of them, but the, it's the orphans I'm most proud of. And the orphan is, I believe that uh, the uh, solar energy is going to uh, assist civilization. And, and of, of course it is already, but largely is coming through government subsidies. Unfortunately, when that happens, it ends up subsidizing the old technology, which is uh, silicon solar panels. And I want the world to adopt the, uh, uh, the thin film uh, direct cap semiconductors, which are more efficient, more practical, in the long run will cost less. And I feel there's a crusade, but I'm running against the, against the grain. I'm going against the tide. And uh, 
that's the, uh, that's the one thing that I envision will end up being uh, the most important. Uh, the reason being that we're eventually going to get all our energy from solar energy. The idea of going out and uh, digging in the ground is going to be regarded as uh, incredibly Neanderthal, incredibly uh, old. I should mention other projects uh, that we have. The, uh, the inverse of the photonic crystal, which is the optical antenna. Uh, again, an orphan of physics. Antennas have been neglected since Marconi's time. And uh, to reintroduce that into optics, uh, it, this is uh, currently uh, a very important project. Uh, we're very fortunate to get a very large grant in the United States to find a replacement for the transistor. Of course, it's very challenging. We have not found a replacement. Uh, but if we find something good, uh, that will also have a huge effect on civilization. Uh, if, uh, certainly, yeah, yeah. you replace what? The transistor? And uh, that would be uh, very, very exciting. So those are the three areas, the, the uh, solar area uh, to replace the transistor and the idea of using optical antennas as a normal routine thing. Those are my three big areas of research right now. I think I just need to be the best scientist I can possibly be and uh, that this will end up uh, helping, uh, helping the privileged, helping the underprivileged, helping everybody. I've always felt this uh, social responsibility uh, to uh, create uh, scientific advancements that, that help the society make life better and uh, it, it to me is a dream. I look back and I realize I've actually done that for heaven's sake and people are actually using my stuff. And to me, that's, that's rather unbelievable because it was a dream for such a very long period of time.